Anyway, glad to have you here this morning. Um, if you weren't here last week, we started a new series and you missed out on the kickoff. Uh, but that's okay, it's online. Uh, we DVR'd the message, so it was good. And it's online, so you can go back and, and uh, watch that if you, if you missed the message last week. Um, we're really excited about this series, Go Big or Go Home. Uh, we hear that said a lot, uh, especially when it's football season, you know, all that kind of stuff, you know, go big or go home. And uh, we started this series last week, and last week we talked about serving and getting involved and getting joining the team so that we can accomplish what God wants us to accomplish in this town. Because we all know there's some things that need to be fixed in Perry, right? And we believe who is the solution to that? Right, exactly. So if we will serve him because God, by the way, in case you didn't know this, God planned to use us to change things. God planned to use us to bring about his kingdom on earth. God planned, and, and it's been his plan all along, is to start something called the church. And when he started the church, he said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I believe he meant that. Now, some people, and maybe some churches you've been to, you thought, good Lord, it seems like hell. But anyway, I know, I grew up like that too. I used to think going to church was like going to hell at one point. Uh, just kidding, it wasn't that bad. But here's the thing. We've decided that we're not going to just have church. Okay, there's too many people that are living and dying without Jesus for us to just sit around and have church right? So here's what we want to do. We want to get everybody on the team because the more people on the team, more people on the field means more impact. So the more people we get on this team, we can do more things for the glory of God. We can reach more people. More people will come in this room and give their lives to Jesus. That's why we all need to be on the team. So if you didn't join the team last week, we encourage you to do that this week. And you've got the whole pamphlet that Jerry was talking about. We encourage you to look over that and see if there's a place that you think you could join the team and help us accomplish what God has planned for us. Because here's the thing. If you don't let God use you, he'll use someone else. And you'll miss out on God's plan for your life. So don't just sit around. We don't want to just sit around and have church. We want to do things for the glory of God. We want to accomplish things. We want to see more people go from death to life. And that's what it's all about. So this week, we're going to talk about something along the same lines, but um, we're going to talk about huddle up. You know, in football, there's a huddle, right? Now, what they do in this huddle, apparently, I don't really know because I never played football, but I think what they're doing is they're deciding what they're going to do right? They're listening to the quarterback. He's going to say, I want, here's the play we're going to run, and he says something like blue 722 or whatever it is, and I never could figure out what those numbers. The time when I played football, they're like, screen, we're going to do screen. I'm like, okay. And we get set, and I'm like, what the heck is a screen? I don't have any clue what that is. Like, I know screen door, but I don't know what screen means, right? You know, and then, and then there's all these other plays. And anyway, in the huddle, that's where they decide, all right, here's how we're going to accomplish the play. Here's how we're going to accomplish the playbook that we've been given by our coaches. And they get the plan together, and then they do what? They break, and then they play the, play the game. So here's what I'm going to talk to you about is the huddle. Because we can come to church every Sunday. We can serve on a ministry team. But if we miss the huddle, we miss out on the plan. If we miss the huddle, we don't know exactly what's going on. If we miss out on the huddle, we miss out on what we're doing and we're playing the game. Because here's the thing. I used to go into the huddle when I did play football for two weeks. Um, when I got in the huddle, I didn't know what the heck was going on. So I was just standing there. Okay, screen pass, got it. I'm just going to run and hope you throw me the ball. I don't, I don't know what to do, right? But if I had known the plays, if I had been a football person to begin with, and, and I got into the huddle, I would understand what's going on, and then I would know what to do. But here's the thing about today and what we're talking about. If you miss the huddle, you miss out on what we're doing. If you miss the huddle, you're missing a vital part of what's going on in the kingdom of God through Cornerstone. So we're going to talk about huddling up today. You know, when, they, when, when the players get into the huddle they, and, and they huddle up outside of the game in the locker room, they, they do all, these, all sorts of things, right? They, get down, they, they sit down and they learn the plays. They, they look at a big whiteboard or chalkboard and the plays are drawn up and they're explain, it's explained to them how this works and how the game works, how the playbook is applied. They also watch films of the, of the previous games to see how bad they did, right, Tennessee? Um, and then, 
just throwing that out there. If you're a Tennessee fan, sorry, but that was awful. Now, um, it was funny. I was watching the, the Florida-Tennessee game uh, yesterday, and there was that play where the guy hurt his knee. Did, did y'all see that? Where he's, like, running, and he's doing really good, and then all of a sudden he goes, <laughs> and he's just out. I'm like, the dude had a heart attack. What happened? <laughs> like, he just fell out. But nobody seemed to care for a while, right? They just kept on going. They showed the replay a few times. I'm like, the dude fell out, man. Somebody go run, run, check the guy out, right? And it was just he hurt his knee, right? But it looked really bad. But I thought that was so funny. But that has nothing to do with today's message. I just thought I'd throw that in there. Uh, but but what, the, what the team does is they get in huddles and they learn how to do better at what they're doing. It's not just a huddle in the game. It's the huddle outside of the game where they get together in the locker room or in the film room and they huddle up and they, decide, and they talk about how, do, how can we do this better? How do we apply the playbook we've been given? So here's the connection. We have a playbook in life. It's called the Word of God, the Bible. It's the playbook. It's the instructions for how we are to live our life, how we can be successful at what God's called us to do. It's the plan that God has for us that's in this book. We have the playbook. It's not the, God's plan is not some cosmic secret. He wrote it down. Here it is. All you have to do is read it and get in a huddle with some other people who can help you understand how to apply the playbook. You know, sometimes in, in my life group, it's, it's funny, we, we, have a, we have an interesting group. We have, we have some new believers. We have some people who have been in church their whole life. You know, we have pretty and ugly. I mean, we, we have lots of people in our group. And I'm um, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> See, tonight, group is at my house, and I'm feeding everybody. And that's good because that means you can't poison me. Now, um, our group is a lot of fun. We have, what, we have different types of group groups which we'll talk about in a few minutes but our, our group is what we call a life group and it's a very close-knit group of people and we we spend time together outside the group and things like that but here's what I can tell you about about a group there's no way there's no way I could survive just attending church I have to be involved in a group of people who love me and love God and I know they can help me when I need their help that's why the huddle is so important. We get to sit down and talk about how does this book that God has written to us, how does this work on Monday morning? Because it sounds great on Sunday, right? It sounds easy on Sunday, but Monday morning it's a little bit harder, right? We read about forgiveness, and forgiveness seems just so easy on Sunday, right? Oh, yeah, God wants us to forgive. He'll help us forgive. He'll, he'll help us heal the wounds from, from unforgiveness and when we've been hurt. And yay, forgiveness, right? I mean, we do the wave for forgiveness. That's great. But on Monday morning, it's like when that coworker says something behind your back and you hurt them, forgiveness ain't so easy anymore, is it? But when you have a group of people who can help you understand, look, here's how we forgive, or here's how we, whatever it is in this book, that group can help you apply the truth. Now, I've I found a passage of Scripture that I want to share with you today. It's in Luke chapter 5. If you have a Bible, I would encourage you to turn there. You may have totally missed out on this story, especially if you're new, uh, new to reading the Scripture. You may not have seen this before. Now, this is a very interesting story. It's one of my favorite passages, in, in the, in, definitely in the Gospels. Um, Luke 5, verse 17. Now, as we read through this, you're going to see something that's pretty amazing and it may be completely unbelievable at first but you got to remember we're talking about God here and he can do anything right so let's read verse 17 it says one day as he that's Jesus was teaching Pharisees and teachers of the law now let's stop there for a second in case you don't know Pharisees are the religious elite of the day they were extremely legalistic they were all about the Old Testament law all over 600 laws in the Old Testament they had them memorized I mean they were the most religious people you've ever met in your life they stood on the street corner and prayed in these big eloquent prayers for everybody to see them and how religious they are that's the kind of people that came to see Jesus at this in this story so Pharisees and teachers of the law who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. That's a big area of people. So there's a lot of people. And they were sitting there. And the power of the Lord was present with him, Jesus, to heal the sick. All right, so, so I want you to get a picture of this. There's a house, and Jesus is there teaching, and there are uber-religious people coming from this huge area and all coming to listen to Jesus. They want to hear what he's got to say. Now, most of the people 
didn't like Jesus. Most of the religious people did not like Jesus. People that weren't religious liked him because he hung out with them. He helped them understand who God was. He revealed to them who he was, and he did great things for them. But religious people didn't like Jesus. In case you didn't know, religious people killed Jesus. Okay, so religion, it sounds wonderful, but it might end up you kill your own Messiah. Anyway, now, so there's a bunch of religious people there, and they're listening to him. Some of them trying to catch him in something he's saying. Uh, they didn't like him. They didn't like the things that he said. So they're just there listening to see what happens. And now this is the interesting part. Verse 18. Some men came carrying a paralytic, so a guy that's paralyzed, on a mat, and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. Now, the Gospel of Mark says that this is about four men were carrying this guy, okay? Verse 19, when they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof. Now, this is crazy, but they did it, okay? They went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. All right, now let's go back to that mental picture. There's a house. There's a ton of religious people there to hear Jesus, and the crowd is so great that these men carrying their friend who's paralyzed, and we don't know if he's been paralyzed his whole life. We don't know if it was something that happened to him recently. We're not told those details. But they're carrying their friend on a mat to Jesus, and the crowd is so big that they can't get in. There's no way they're going to get in. There's people, as far as we can tell, Houses were not huge. I mean, they didn't have 4,000 square foot houses, you know, back then. I mean, if they did, they were the king, <laughs> right? So they had small houses. But there's so many people there, they can't even get in. So you can picture they're probably standing outside, and they're holding their friend on this mat, and they know that Jesus is the answer to this guy's situation. They know that if they can get in to Jesus, something awesome can happen. They know if they can bring their friend who's completely helpless into Jesus that he could heal them or at least could help him understand his situation. And they're standing outside and they can't get in this house. So these guys, and just think about this for a second. These guys must really believe that Jesus is the Son of God because here's what they do. There's a ton of people who are the Pharisees, the religious, the teachers of the law, who have the ability to prosecute them for doing something and interrupting what they're doing. They had the ability to hold them to the law if they did something crazy. So there's a little bit of fear there, but these four guys carrying their friend on a mat knows, if I can just get in there, if I can get my friend in there to Jesus, he can help him. So here's what they do. Okay, we can't get in the room. Let's go on the roof. I wonder what the paralytic guy was thinking. He's on a mat, right? He's laid out. He's like, we're doing what? <laughs> oh, we're, we're going to take you. There, we can't get in the door. Uh, there's so many. See all these people. There's so many people here, buddy. We, we, we're not going to be able to get in. Paralytic guy was like, can we just come back tomorrow? Like, is he going to be here? Like, I hear he goes around town to town. We just follow him, right? Well, hey, we can wait till the meeting's over. Wait till all the religious people are gone, and then we'll approach Jesus, right? And they're like, no, we're going on the roof. We're going to do what? <laughs> we're going on the roof. So they go on the roof. And what do they do? They go on top of someone's house. It wasn't their house wasn't the paralytic guy's house they go on top of somebody's house and tear the roof up now let's just think about that for a second let's say you're having your small group meeting at home <laughs> and there's so many people in your group that the next the new person coming can't get in so what do they do they go up on your roof they tear your shingles off. They punch a hole in the deck, decking, and they drop themselves through the roof and land right in front of you while you're helping lead your small group, and they go, here I am. I made it. <laughs> so think. Think how you would feel in that moment. Now think about how those religious people who thought anything like this was absurd they thought there's no way Jesus could heal people anyway. They were always trying to catch Jesus in something he said so they could hold him against the law and murder him and get rid of him because he was causing such an uproar. All those people are the people at the meeting, church people, right? And somebody crawls up on the roof. Okay, let's, let's put it in a little bit bigger context. You're in a Baptist church, okay? <laughs> 
and everybody's like dressed up and they're, they're, they're at church and they, and they really do want to hear what the, the gospel is and the preacher's up there and he's preaching his guts out. He's hitting the pulpit, bruising his hand. I know because I've done that. And somebody tears the roof open and drops a homeless person down. How do you think everybody's going to feel about that? They're going to be a little bit critical. What are they doing here? Why did they tear up our beautiful roof? I mean, they got dust on our chandelier. Right? Here, I'm not making fun of, of, of those kinds of churches. I grew up in those churches, okay? I learned the gospel in those churches, all right? Here's what I'm saying. In this context, it was very similar to that. There were a lot of people there who were religious, who knew the scripture, and they're tearing the roof open and dropping a guy down in front of Jesus while we're trying to listen to what he's saying. Don't you think they were, the Pharisees were like, hey, can you believe these people? What are they doing? They're interrupting the sermon. Uh, we're trying to hear from this guy, and it, you know, don't tell anybody, but we're trying to catch him saying something wrong so we can have him executed, but we're here, and we're here, and this guy's interrupting everything we're trying to do, right? By the way, they tore the guy's house up. I mean, can you believe that? Don't you, don't you know they were like elbowing each other? Can you believe this? And it says they lowered him down right in front of Jesus. Now think about this. You've got to be some pretty good friends to a guy to be willing to tear up somebody else's house, interrupt a meeting full of people to drop your friend down in front of Jesus. You've either got to be two things, a really good friend, or you've got to really believe that Jesus can do something. I would say it's both. Here's what we can learn from this. I want you to fill this in. And this is something that's true. What's true about this guy on the mat that's paralyzed is true of all of us in this room today. At some point, we will all need help. At some point, we will all need help. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. Wait a minute. I thought we needed help all the time. We do. We just forget a lot. But here's the thing. At some point in your life, something's going to happen, and you will need help. And here's the interesting thing about that. That help that you need almost never comes from you. It has to come from something outside of you. It's whether you, you sit down at home and you pray your guts out to ask God for help. But I will tell you this, and I've learned this from experience, and many of you who are in groups have learned this from experience. When you're in a group of people who love you and love God and want to help each other and want to be there for each other, when you're going through something, those people are the ones you end up turning to. And at some point, you will need their help. And that's why we do groups. That's why we have those little huddles all around. We have nine groups that meet right now. And they're different kinds of groups. There's different kinds of people in them. And the context is different. And they may study different things. But here's the most important thing. They're all friends. They all know each other. And they want to help each other through whatever's going on. They want to help each other understand how this book works in everyday life. And when somebody needs help, we all come together and help them. At some point, listen to me, at some point, we're going to be the guy on the mat. We're going to need somebody to take us back to our Savior. We're going to need somebody to give us some advice that helps us through the next situation in our life. We're going to need somebody to help us when we're in financial trouble. We're going to need somebody to help us when we may lose a job and we don't know what to do, and they can help us find another one. We're going to need people. Everybody in this room gets in that situation. Let me ask you this question, though. When that situation comes, who do you have to go to? You say, well, I can, I can pray about it. That's great. You should. But I'll tell you this. As we're going to learn by the end of the message today, you need more than just prayer between you and God. I know you say, wait a minute now. You're saying we need more than God? I'm not saying God's not good enough. I'm just saying God's got a plan that you may not have known about. Now let's look at the next part. In verse 20, it says this. When Jesus saw their faith, I want you to underline the word there. 
When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. So let's go back to that picture. All right, they've lowered their friend down in front of Jesus, interrupted the meeting. I mean, you, can, you know, you can imagine that there's probably some religious people that are sitting on the front row, right? They're, they're super religious. They're front row Christians, right? And or they really weren't Christians back then. Anyway, they were sitting there, and, and they've got dust in their eyes, right? Because these guys just tore open the roof right above our head. Because it said they lowered him in the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. So, I mean, maybe some people had to move out of the way. We don't know. But they lower him down. And Jesus looks up. Looks at this guy. Looks up and sees four guys' heads poking through the hole. Like, all right, are they going to kill us? Are they going to help our friend? Because they really were risking their lives at this point. He sees four, four people looking through the roof. And it says he saw their faith. Not the paralytic's faith, although he was included in that group. Their faith collectively, the four guys on the roof, the guy sitting in front of him. And when he saw their faith, he looked down and said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Now, that's an interesting statement. You think he would say, you're healed. You think the guy on the mat was probably thinking, well, that's great. You forgave my sins. Wonderful. I'm still paralyzed, right? <laughs> I didn't, they, these guys didn't lower me through here to get forgiveness. Although, thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate it, right? I mean, let's just be honest. A lot of times we don't think that way, but these people were humans, right? I mean, they think the way we do. They lower him down. He says, friend, your sins are forgiven. Here's what you need to write down on your connection. There's something powerful about people believing God together. Not just us individually believing that God's awesome and can do things in our lives. There is something powerful about groups of people who are meeting together and saying, we, God, we believe you. We want to know you better. We want to know what your plan is for us. And we want to live this life together. We want to do this together. Because here's the thing. You've got to follow Jesus for yourself. That's a decision you have to make for yourself. But don't ever follow Jesus by yourself. God never planned for us to be alone in our relationship with him. He wants us to have people around us that can help us go through this life. Because, as we just said, at some point, we all need help. At some point, we all need advice. At some point, we need people to show up and care for us when things go wrong and we've seen this time after time after time in our church i just give you a couple examples there was a, there was a group in our in our church they still meet together uh, a lady in the church her freezer had become unplugged she's a single mom all the food in her freezer went bad their group found out about it what they do they went to the uh, grocery store and they filled her freezer back up with food you say, well, well, that's not all that awesome, right? Well, I think it's pretty awesome. <laughs> to that mom, who's a single mom, having to work hard to provide for her two children, that's pretty awesome to know that all your food's gone and, and you, you may not have the money to replace all that, but there's a group of people who just showed up and filled your freezer full of food. That's pretty awesome. I've heard situations where people said, you know, I just did not have a clue what I should do in this situation that I had in my life. But I sat down with my group and I said, here's what's going on. I don't know what to do. What do y'all think? And they gave me the advice that I needed and I applied what they said the scripture teaches about that certain thing and it changed everything. It turned out great. That's pretty awesome. There's been situations where people be in the hospital and their group shows up to visit them. That's pretty awesome. Because I'm telling you, when you're in those situations, you want somebody to be there for you. When there's a death in your family, you want somebody to be there for you. When something's going on financially, you want to know you have somebody to talk to. And when you're in a group, it makes a big difference. See the difference it made here? I mean, if the paralytic guy was just sitting outside on his mat, hey, Jesus, need some help. Something might have happened, maybe, we don't know. But when Jesus saw their faith, now think about this for a second. What if you got into a group and you've been praying your guts out about something? You've been asking God for help on this one thing and you don't know why nothing's happening. 
But you get into a group. What if you got into a group and you told your group, look, here's what I'm going through. I need you guys to pray for me. I need you all to help me understand what's going on if you can. What does the scripture say about this? And that group comes around you. And when God sees their faith, he helps. When God sees their faith, he leads one of them to help you. This is what it's all about. Because at some point, we all need help. We all need people to be around us. So there's something powerful about believing God together. Now, here's what happens, and we're going to kind of skim over this part because it seems kind of ridiculous. But verse 21 is not on your connection, but it's on the screen. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves. Now, they didn't say anything. They just began thinking to themselves. Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Talking about Jesus. Like, really? A guy just got lowered through the ceiling. Okay, there's four guys up there looking through the hole, right? There's a guy laying here, interrupted the whole thing. Jesus says, friend, your sins are forgiven. And the first thing they could think is, this guy's speaking blasphemy. <laughs> like, really? <laughs> That's, you're not thinking, why'd they tear a hole in the roof? <laughs> What's going on? But they said, who's this guy that speaks blasphemy? And then there's very, something very interesting. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Here's what they're thinking. He's speaking blasphemy because he's saying he can forgive somebody's sins. You see, at this time, they didn't understand who Jesus was yet. He was just some teacher, some rabbi, some guy who was teaching these really odd things. He seemed to know the scripture really well. He seemed like a really great guy, but he keeps teaching these things that don't line up with what we thought the Bible was saying. He keeps teaching and saying and doing things that we don't think he should be able to do. So they're trying to catch him in this. And he, he just said he could forgive somebody's sins. Only God can do that. So then here's what he goes on to say, verse 22. Jesus knew what they were thinking. And that's scary. Jesus knows what we're thinking. Right now, he knows what you're thinking. <laughs> dun, 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 right? Right now, he knows you're thinking about the restaurant. <laughs> Right now, he knows you're thinking, I wish this guy would shut up so we can leave. According to that clock, I've got a couple minutes left. So you've got to wait. <laughs> he knows what we're thinking. Jesus knew what they were thinking. He said, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? That's an interesting question. It's kind of confusing to me. Like, about the same amount of words is not really that big a deal, not big difference between the two. You know what I mean? Like, what do you mean easier to say? But here's what he says. But that you may know that the Son of Man, that's Jesus, has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Here's what he's saying. But so that you will know that I am God in the flesh, the very Son of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. So that you'll know that. He said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. That's pretty awesome. This guy just got lowered through a roof. He's laying on the mat. Jesus looks up, and he sees their faith, and he says, your sins are forgiven. And the guy's like, great. Am I going to get to walk again? I'd like to walk in your forgiveness. That'd be nice, right? And then he knows these, these religious people are criticizing him in their hearts. They're thinking negative things about this whole situation. So he says, look, so that all of you who came to hear what I had to say, all of you who came to catch me saying something wrong, I'm going to say something wrong. Your sins are forgiven. And now you're thinking I'm speaking blasphemy. But so you'll know I had the power to forgive sin. Get up, pick up that mat you've been laying on, and go home. And look what happens. Verse 25. Immediately he stood up in front of them. That had to change the church service right there. <laughs> he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. <laughs> okay, so four guys decide our friend's paralyzed, and we know that Jesus is a solution for his situation. We know that Jesus 
uh, is who he says he is. We know that he can do awesome things. He's obviously from God. Who else can do and say the things that he says? So if we could just get him in there, oh, look, there's a big crowd. Let's crawl up on the roof, tear this guy's roof open. We'll pay for it later. He's probably got homeowner's insurance. It's all right. We're going to tear a hole in his roof. We'll say it was a hell storm, whatever. Or maybe God rained down fire from heaven, created a hole. Insurance covers acts of God, right? Not really. Anyway, they they tear this hole open. They lower the guy down in front of Jesus, and they're just there waiting. And he says, your sins are forgiven. They're like, okay, that's good. What's next? And then he says, get up, take your mat, and go home. And they see their friend who they've done all this work, they've risked, risked everything for. They see their friend stand up. And not only does he stand up, he picks up the mat they brought him on, picks it up, and goes home praising God. Those are some pretty good friends, huh? Because, see, here's what you need to know about this guy. He may have never walked again if his friends hadn't taken him to Jesus. And that's what groups are all about. Our friends, all of us going toward God together, understanding what he wants for our life from his word. And when people need help, we help each other. At any time, when there's something needed, we're there for each other. Here's what he says in verse 26. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. The religious people that were trying to catch him in a trap who were there. It says, everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. And that's what I want us to focus on. We have seen remarkable things today. Last Sunday at the end of the message... I took a risk and I said, you know what, if you want to be on the team with us, just stand up where you are. And just about everybody in here stood up. And we had so many people sign up to join the team. And that was a remarkable thing to see. We went home thinking, we have seen some pretty remarkable things today. God is doing things in our church, doing things in our community and we want to see that continue. But here's the thing about groups. If you'll get in a group, it may take you a while. But when you find that, that group where you just feel like you fit in and those people start building strong relationships and you begin to be part of the group, you will begin to see remarkable things in your life. I know you may not believe it yet, but I can tell you story after story after story of where remarkable things happened in groups. And they would, if they could come up here on stage and tell you, they would tell you this. They would say, I don't know what I would do without my group. There are things in my life that God has done that I don't think would have ever happened if I hadn't got in a group. You say, how do you know that? Because they tell us this all the time. Last week, I, and, and I hope I can use you as an example, Spirit, and, uh, in our group, I heard him say this, and I, I almost burst into tears, and I'm not much of a crier. But I held it in, right? <laughs> Got to be tough, you know. Go big or go home, yeah. But he said this. He said, man, he said, I'm so glad that we made this decision to follow Jesus and we now can raise our son in a different way. Go big or go home. That's what I'm talking about. Now, that's just one example. One example. Out of the nine other groups we have, there are just there's story after story after story. Here's why I'm telling you all this. Why in the world, if God works that way, if God sees the faith of a group and does remarkable things, why would we not be in a group? It's just like, what if, what if we said that at this location, at this time, Jesus is going to be there? How many of you would show up? Almost all of you. I don't know what's going on with the rest of you. But anyway, if, if Jesus was actually going to show up and he was going to tell you what's going on in your life, he was going to tell you, here's how you can fix this certain thing. Oh, you can't walk? I'll heal you. I mean, it just goes on. If we knew, we would all be there. Why? Because we knew that he could do something. He could tell us something that we needed to hear. Same thing with groups. 
You say, well, Jesus is not there. Yes, he is. You just can't see him. (laughs) But when a group of people get together, they bring the Spirit with them because the Spirit of God lives in us. And when we get together and we talk about the Scripture, God does remarkable things. He does, listen, I'm the pastor of the church and I need my group. There's no way I would try to live life without it. You need it. You need it. And here's the proof. Here's today's truth, and and then we're going to wrap it up. God created people to need people. He did. You may not have ever heard that before. So wait a minute. God created people to need God. That's true. But if you go back and read the first few chapters of Genesis, you find out that God was with Adam, that Adam walked with God in the cool of the day, as it says, that he literally had conversation with God. He knew who God was. God came and talked with him. They had fellowship together. I mean, they, they had a strong relationship. Adam was not alone. He had God, right? But what does God say about his creation? After he's created uh, all the things that he's created, and he's created Adam, he says, it's not good for man to be alone. I will create someone for him. There's two needs that you have in your life. You desperately need God, and you desperately need people. You really do. You say, wait a minute. I know some people, and I don't think I need them. (laughs) Listen, that might be true. (laughs) Maybe they're the wrong people. But God created you to need people, and that's why you need to be in a group. Not because it's the right religious thing to do. It has nothing to do with that. Not because it's just a requirement of Cornerstone, because it's not a requirement. It's just something that we all believe biblically we should do. Not because it's, it's just some, on some list somewhere of, on a church covenant or something. None of that. You need to be in a group because you need a group. You need those friends that will lower you through a roof in the middle of a church service if they had to. Now, I'm not saying that uh, one, one of your groups need to try that next Sunday. You're going to have a little bit harder time getting through the metal and then through the ceiling. But uh, here's, what, here's what you need to know. If you don't have a group, you may not have any help when the time comes. You have our church family, but I'm telling you, when things happen, there's so many people in our church, if you're not in a group and something happens to you, we may never even know about it. But if you're in a group... We can find out. We know what's going on. We can help you. We can be there for you. But it almost never happens unless you're in a group. So here's what I want you to do. I want, to take, I want you to take your, your little pamphlet out that says groups, fall groups on it. This is our fall semester. If you don't know anything about groups, um, we do a semester system. It kind of goes along with the school year. And that gives you a chance to change groups if you need to. You don't have to be in a group forever and just die in a group you don't like, right? You can change groups if you need to. Um, It's not, listen to me, if you're new here, you need to understand, this is not Sunday school, okay? That's not what it is. We don't get in a room and somebody stands up and they teach us from a quarterly thing that was shipped to them from somebody who has no clue what we're doing, right? I mean, they're they're going along with the sermon. Uh, They're continuing what we talked about on Sunday morning, or there's a DVD series that you you watch and you learn from. But the big thing is, is it's about relationships. So we have this group system that you can get involved in. And we don't want you to be in a group that you don't like. You can, you can change groups. You can test drive a group. But you'll see all the groups here. Now, there's something new in here that you may not know about. And, and I'm going to explain that in a second. But one thing I want you to know is that everybody here who's currently in a group needs to sign up. That, that helps us keep track of who's in a group. Okay? And then if you, you want to be in a group, you can sign up with this little card that will tear off. Now, let me tell you about the, the new stuff. There are different types of groups in our church now. We used to just have life groups. Now life groups is a part of something bigger. Our whole group system is we now have connection groups, which are a little bit bigger groups. Uh, there may be you know, 10 to 15 to maybe 20 people in, in those connection groups. Um, and you see the list of those there. They're in red. Um, not red because they're bad or anything. They're just in red to show you the difference. Um, 
And there are different groups there. You can read through those and see which one you might want to fit in. If you're not in a group or maybe you feel like you need to change groups, this is the time to do that. And in just a moment, we're going to fill all this out. Jerry's going to come out and, and do, handle all that. But I want you to look through these groups uh, because we've got connection groups, which are a little bit bigger, a little more social. And then you've got life groups, which are a little bit smaller. And these are people who have probably been in a connection group already. And they developed a close friendship with a small group of people. And they started their own group. Um, the group that I'm in is what we call a life group. It's, it's fairly small. We're all really good friends. We've been in relationships for a, for a long time. And we all click together really well. So we're in, we're in what we call a life group. And then the other thing is a discipleship group. And we've only got one group of that so far, but there'll be more to come. Um, and that's where they're going to go through studies, talk about certain topics, or whatever it may be. Um, most groups follow the sermon series. There's a life group guide on the back of your uh, sermon outline in your connection. And they just go through that and talk about how what we talked about, talked about in here, how does that work on everyday life. So if you want to do that, you can sign up for a group. But here's the thing you need to understand more than anything else. The time will come when you will need people. Why not get in a group where you know those people will be there when you need them? Because it could change everything for you. It could help you understand the scripture better. It could help you get to know God better. 